kids, you're dismissed to Lightkeepers. And you can make your way down there. Uh, if you don't know, the past week I was in Boston, so there will be words that will be Bostonian that will come out this week because whenever I go back, I make sure they understand that I'm from there and talk the way that God intended us to talk. So, uh, but you will hear, even during the CLC hour, I was saying words as they were coming out. I thought, oh, well, that's all right. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. And we're going to be in the passage we just read for scripture reading, so you just keep your Bibles open to Luke chapter 9, but let's have a word of prayer as we start. Father, we thank you so much uh, to be back in your word today. Um, Just so thankful for the truths that we sang about. We all know our own hearts. We all know the depths of our own sin. We're learning about it each day more and more, and to think that we don't stand condemned before you. The one who was innocent stood condemned in our place. Our sin is nailed to the cross. Lord, help us to truly believe that in our hearts, to live in light of that. The shame and the guilt we, we don't have to live in, and we can live in newness of life and walk in newness of life because of what you've done to us. So, Lord, we thank you so much for that. As we come to this passage, I pray that you would give us understanding so that we would love Christ more and be committed in how we live. In Christ's name, amen. We're back in the book of Luke today. Took a break last week just to prepare for the election. Um, to remind ourselves, no matter what, last week, it's still true even today, that no matter what happens each day, God is still in control. God is still ruling. God is still reigning. Our call in life doesn't change and how we should live our lives, whether we're pleased or not pleased with last week's election, and whether we're pleased or not pleased in the election in two years and four years, and it doesn't matter. God's in control. He's still in control, and he's still ruling and reigning every day. But today, I want to get back into the Gospel of Luke, back into focusing on learning more about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the passage we come to today that we read, chapter 9, verses 1 through 17, It's now getting us in the book of Luke towards the end of a major section in Jesus' life, an era, you could say, of Jesus' life, and a major section in the book of Luke. Jesus had begun his ministry of preaching back in chapter 4 in Galilee, chapter 4 and verse 14. Right after he faced the 30 days of temptation uh, from Satan in the desolate place, then he goes into public ministry and he's proclaiming the coming of the kingdom of God. And he's been ministering up and around the area of Galilee. We've seen him in different places up there. But for the most part, as you picture Israel and you see the Sea of Galilee, his ministry is focused in that area, proclaiming the kingdom of God. That's going to change at the end of this chapter. There's going to be a shift in Jesus' ministry. So look at verse 51 of chapter 9. And you're going to see things are changing. Verse 51 says this, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, now, right, implied there, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He's going to be moving away from Galilee and the ministry he's had there, and he's going to be making his way down to Jerusalem. And so what's going to come through the rest of this book is going to have, it's going to really focus on Jesus's journey down to Jerusalem And then his ministry in Jerusalem, culminating in the most important event in his life, the death, burial, and then resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Luke is getting us towards that direction. But in chapter 9, we're kind of concluding, you could say, his Galilean ministry. What's interesting, if you're looking at Luke, is there's not a lot of talk or really any of his death at this point. We don't know about the cross, you could say, if you're just reading through the, the Gospel of Luke. The majority of what Jesus has been doing so far is preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. He's been healing all sorts of diseases. He's been casting out demons and raising some people from the dead. And you could say his, his ministry at this point has been characterized by uh, being triumphant, right? Constantly doing amazing things before all the people. But that's going to start to change. The tone and nature of what he came to do is going to change even in the chapter that we're looking at. And so 
as we go through this chapter, chapter 9 especially, what Jesus is going to share more about in this chapter is who he is and what he came to do. And of course, for his disciples, it's going to be hard for them to understand. And for us, it's going to be helping us understand who exactly Jesus is and the nature of what he came to do. So these first 50 verses in Luke chapter 9 actually really focuses on two things. And we're going to see both of them this morning. The first is the idea of understanding who Christ is, Christology. It's going to develop a greater understanding of the nature of who Jesus is and what he came to do. And secondly, it's going to focus on discipleship what it means to genuinely be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's actually going to get clarified throughout this chapter as we get in. Luke is going to help us understand the nature of both, which makes pretty good sense, right? I mean, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you probably should have a good idea of who Christ is, don't you think? If you're going to be a disciple of him, you probably should know correctly about who he is. Know the one that you say you're following. And further, if you are going to be a disciple of Jesus, you probably should have a good understanding of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Defined as the scriptures will say and as Jesus will say in Luke chapter 9. I mean, Today, there's no doubt that people have all sorts of ideas of what it means to follow Jesus and to be a disciple of Jesus. But Luke, let's let Luke help shape our understanding in chapter 9. And so in this chapter, Luke's going to get right into both of those. It's going to help us understand who Christ is and what it means to be a disciple of his. And you're going to see that in our first 17 verses this morning. So let's jump in there first you're going to see discipleship starting to come into focus. And that's verses 1 through 9. Discipleship is coming into focus now in verses 1 through 9. Look at verse 1. He called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics and whatever how shall you enter, stay there, and from there depart, wherever they not receive you. When you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now, Jesus has started preaching. I just, just said this. In chapter 4. But it's not until chapter 5 we start to see people follow Jesus. Uh, at the beginning of chapter 5, you see Jesus calling his first disciples. He calls uh, Peter, James, and John. And then it's clear as you're going through the book of Luke that a crowd starts to follow Jesus. And many of those in that crowd are considered disciples of Jesus. So that when you come to the end of chapter 5, the Pharisees are like, hey, why don't your disciples wash their hands like, like they should? Why are your disciples not doing this? It was understood that there was a group who's following Jesus who would be considered the disciples of Jesus. And then in chapter 6, you have Jesus actually calling out people by name, 12 men in particular, the 12 apostles whom he names. But he calls them out from his group of disciples. And you can see that in chapter 6, verse 12 through 16. For the most part, though, as we've been going through Luke, there's actually really been very little discussed about the disciples. We don't really know what they're doing. We know they're with Jesus. We know that there's a lot of them with Jesus. But we don't really see them doing much. And the most extensive passage so far, besides the calling of Peter that you see in chapter 5 and the naming of them in chapter 6, when you get most of what you see about the disciples, the, the biggest Text is chapter 8, verses 22 through 25, with the story of them uh, going across the lake and the great storm that comes. And, and what we do learn of the disciples is not really good at that point, right? They're scared to death. And then they end that whole narrative, and that chapter 8, verse 25, is saying, and they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, this is the people who were called as 12, who then is this, that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? So if we're just reading the gospel of Luke, we don't really know what the disciples are doing. 
We know that they're following Jesus. That's pretty much all we know at this point. We don't really know what is entailed with discipleship, maybe leaving their nets and following Jesus, but that's about all we know. There's not much that's clarified for us, but that's going to start to change, especially in chapter 9. We're going to start to see what discipleship looks like. We're going to start to see how discipleship comes in focus, and in our first six verses, we're going to start seeing what is understood as, as being the work of a disciple. Here you have Jesus in chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, showing us what a disciple of his is going to start doing. Look at verses 1 through 2. This is the summary of this whole thing. He called the 12, verse 1, together and gave them power and authority over all demons to cure disease. And notice, verse 2, he sent them out. Why? To proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. He pulls together his disciples, his 12 in particular, of among this group, and he gives them power and authority, as you can see in verse number one there, to heal and to cast out demons. And the purpose being to send them out to proclaim, in verse two, the kingdom of God and to heal those with whom they came in contact with. In other words, if you've been reading the book of Luke, what Jesus sends them out to do is what Jesus has been doing. That's been the ministry of Jesus, to proclaim the kingdom of God and also, he's been healing and casting out demons. That's his ministry since chapter 4. And so he sends them out to proclaim this good news and heal. And look at the instructions he gives them in verses 3 through 5. He tells them in verse 3, pack light. Don't take extra stuff with you. Uh, take nothing for your journey. No staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money. And do not have uh, two tunics. He tells them, don't take a lot with you. Why? There could be a few reasons. First, it's a short trip. We know that because verse 10, they're back on the scene and reporting to Jesus that what they did in that trip. And secondly, I think it shows that they had to be completely dependent upon Jesus, even on this trip. They had to be completely dependent on the people who would receive them on this trip. So there was a sense where even Jesus is teaching them as they go out on this mission to be fully dependent on Upon him. He had to go out in faith, knowing that the Lord would provide for them. And then look at verse 4. As they go out, there's going to be some that are going to take them in. Whatever house, verse 4, you enter, stay there, and from there depart. Jesus knew that there would be those who would take them in and take care of them and, uh, for the message they proclaimed. And so the, the disciples are told, accept this hospitality. They actually were dependent on this hospitality. But, verse 5, not all would be so welcoming. So he says, and whenever, wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. That's quite an act. That's something the Jewish people would do. They would actually, as they walk through a Gentile town, they would collect the dust of the Gentile territory on their feet. And when they got out of the Gentile town, they would shake the dust off to get rid of the uncleanness of the Gentile town on them. And Jesus is saying as he sends them to Jewish, the Jewish crowd, those that don't accept you, shake off your feet, shake off the dirt from your feet in verse number five. Why? As he says, to be a testimony against them, a testimony that they had refused to accept this new era of God's plan of redemption. And that's Jesus' instructions for them in verses three through five. So look at verse six. They go. They do what he says, and they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere, doing exactly what Jesus said. Now, what Jesus is helping us do at this point in chapter 9, or you could say Luke, through uh, what the narration of what Jesus does here in verses 1 through 6, is he's starting to help us understand the nature of what it means to be a disciple even more. It's not just following Jesus, as you'll see going to tell us what following Jesus looks like. It's more than simply that. For the first time, Jesus now sends out his disciples to be doing what he's been doing. You could say to be conduits of the good news to the people. It's clear that those, the disciples, especially the 12 at this point, are not only those who follow Jesus, but a true disciple will be one who proclaims the good news of Jesus. 
that's going to get clarified for us. Now, in this case, he's speaking specifically to the 12 disciples. But this commissioning of the 12 disciples becomes a preview of what he's going to do to all his disciples eventually. Actually, just a few chapters later, just flip over to chapter 10. Most of your Bibles have headings. You look at the heading at the beginning of chapter 10, and what are you going to find? Jesus now sends out more than the 12, doesn't he? Sends out 72. More disciples are going to be involved with this commissioning to go out and proclaim the gospel. And then as Jesus closes the book in the book of Luke, we find Jesus once again commissioning the disciples with the same very thing, to be his witnesses. Luke chapter 24, verses 45 through 48, which says, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins, here it is, should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You, disciples, are witnesses of these things. So you can almost see that Luke 6 becomes kind of the prototype for this commissioning that's going to take place because then you get to Luke chapter 10, he sends out 72. By the end of the book, he's sending out all his disciples to proclaim and to witness the great work that he's done, to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the message of the good news of the kingdom. Disciples will not be merely those who follow Christ, but also those who proclaim the message of Christ, the coming of the kingdom of God. So these few verses kind of give us an insight in what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Let me just give you two that I see here. First is this, a disciple declares. A disciple declares. Jesus empowers the 12 in verse 1 and sends them out with a message. And then you start the second half of the, of the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And what do you find Jesus doing? Same exact thing. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power. Chapter 9, verse 1. He called the 12 together and gave them power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Jesus empowers his disciples in Acts chapter 1 with the Spirit, which happens, what happens then in chapter 2 of Acts? The Spirit comes, and what do they do? They proclaim the good news. They share the good news. Immediately, the disciples go out into the world and proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Listen, this is the point. This is what it means to be a disciple. This is normal for a disciple. It is normal for a disciple to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. A disciple of Jesus is one who declares the good news of the gospel. It's not something reserved just for pastors or elders or people who are only in full-time ministry. It's not just for the, like, the, like, the, you know, the really spiritual Christians, the one that, you know, I'm pressing on to the upward plane, the upward plane Christians. It, it's not just those that are commissioned to share the good news. Jesus is helping to start us, helping us to start see what discipleship entails in chapter 9. It's going to be a lot. But as he starts, he shows them that they're going to do essentially the things he's been doing. And that starts with proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. A disciple is one who declares the message of the kingdom. It's for every single person that says they are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Every single one. Now, again, I'm going to go back. That is the norm for a disciple of Jesus Christ. Naturally, to be a disciple of Jesus is to be commissioned by Jesus to declare the good news. I've given this quote before, partly because I need it. It's, you know, it's a swarm, a swarm, that's not even a word, let's try. Firm swift, put those together, you get swarm. Swarm. 
uh, kick that we need. And what's that? Fine Project says this. There's ample and strong evidence, in other words, that speaking the word of God to others for their salvation and encouragement is an expected and necessary component of the normal Christian life. Which makes me think that the average American church is abnormal. This makes sense. I mean, as Jesus is going to help us understand discipleship, we're going to learn that disciples are those who go and proclaim the good news. That's expected. Aren't you thankful that someone did that to you? Right? Aren't you, someone, aren't you thankful that someone came and proclaimed to you the goodness of the kingdom of God? Whether it be your parents or a coworker or a family member or an unsaved person or maybe a random person on the street? Aren't you thankful for that? Wouldn't it naturally follow that we would then go and do the same? Likewise, like Jesus did, so his disciples will do. Which means it's abnormal to be a disciple of Christ and not do this. Secondly, it's already hinted at in verse number 5. It's going to be clarified as you go through the end of the chapter. A disciple will face opposition. A disciple will face opposition. But in verse 5, Jesus anticipated that they're not going to be received by everybody. Not everyone's going to receive them. He tells them what to do when they're not received. Now, I'm not saying you go, you know, when you leave your co-worker's house, you dust your feet off at their... That's not the point, right? He's talking to Israel and their refusal to accept the message of the kingdom that had been in the flow of everything that's come before all the way back to Genesis. But the truth is that they're going to face opposition, and so we will face opposition. We should expect that as a disciple of Jesus Christ for people not to be happy with the message that we proclaim. I mean, I was just talking to my CLC class, and the, the whole time, the title was uh, Element Number 2, Rebellion. We rebel against God. Nobody wants to hear that you're a rebel a true rebel, a true sinner. We should expect opposition. There's a hint of that even in chapter, seven, uh, chapter 9, verses 7 through 9. It's kind of interesting passage. Why, a verse, why does Luke insert 7 through 9? It seems random, right? This story about Herod. Look at verse 7. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard all that was happening, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had arisen. Herod said, John, I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. Now, what's interesting is verses 7 through 9 transition us from verse 1, 6 down to verses 10 through 17. It kind of has an element for both. Herod hears about what's going on. Now, in verse 7, when it says, now Herod heard all that was happening, I'm going to argue that he's hearing what the disciples are doing that were just sent out. Contextually, that makes sense. They go out, they start proclaiming the goodness, they start, they start healing, and Herod gets wind of this. Herod, of course, is in the, the palace. He's one of the, uh, the four tetrarchs who were there, and he hears what's going on, sees what's going on. He's very curious about it, and all these things are coming back to him. But it, the point is, it's catching the ear of Herod. And when you look at Herod in the Gospel of Luke, he's not a good guy. He's always opposed to the work of God. We saw him earlier. Look what he says to his own account, verse 9. I beheaded John. He imprisoned John. He cut off his head eventually. We find Herod again in chapter 13. Guess what he's doing? Plotting to kill Jesus. Then when he finally meets Jesus, he meets him at his trial, and it ends with Herod flogging and mocking Jesus. He's always opposed to Jesus in the book of Luke. And so there's even a hint here that catching the eye or the ear, you could say, of Herod is going to result in potential opposition for the disciples. We should expect opposition. These disciples are going to face opposition. All true disciples of Christ, if we're truly truly sharing the word of God with others, are going to face opposition. It's a theme that you're going to find throughout the whole scriptures, especially the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus 
will be persecuted. There's no subjunctive. There's no may. It's will. It's fact. A godly life is a life for the disciple. A life for the disciple is what? What did, what did he say? Someone who shares the message of the gospel. I remember I read this verse one time. This is a few years back. I didn't have any gray hair. I couldn't grow a beard. And uh, it, it was a, a young girl, college girl, who read this, and, and she said, wait, wait hold, hold up, hold up. Are you saying that this says all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted? Yes. I'm not persecuted. So does that mean I'm not godly? It's a good question. And through the Lord's grace, through the uh, Spirit, I said, well, when's the last time you shared the gospel with anyone? Because I think if you share it enough, you, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to get beaten. But you will face rejection. You will be called ignorant. You will be called intolerant. You will face the wrath of our culture. Disciples were going out to proclaim the news of the kingdom of God, and they're reminded in verse 5 that some will reject it. So for us, as we share that good news, you can expect it will not be received well by all. And so now in chapter 9, verses 1 through 6 especially, he starts to help us see that there's more to discipleship than just hanging around with Jesus. There's some work that the disciples are called to do. They're called to proclaim the kingdom of God. It's following Christ for sure, but now he empowers them and sends them out. So a disciple is one who proclaims the kingdom of God. That's the first major theme that you're going to find in chapter 9, discipleship. Interestingly, verses 10 through 17 now move us to the second major theme, Christology, who Christ is. Verses 7 through 9 transition us. Verse 7 again, look at that. Herod the Tetrarch heard about all this. He was perplexed because some said that John had been raised from the dead, the one he had cut his head off. Others were saying Elijah in verse 8, and others one of the prophets. And so verse 9, we get this question again. And a lot of times, I love it, how Luke shapes his narrative. He's going to give us a question and then answer the question. The disciples, who then is this, that even the winds and the waves obey him? He's going to answer it with the narrative. And now he does the same thing. So in verse number 9, Herod said, John, I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he, shot, he sought to, to see him, unfortunately, not to hear from him. But then in verses 10 through 17, he's going to answer that question with a narrative. So now you have this Christology, you could say, in verses 10 through 17, developed further. Verse 10, on their return, that is the disciples from verses 1 through 6, the apostles told him all that they had done. So they tell Jesus of everything, and then notice in verse 10, he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. He takes them to this area. Um, if you're, so let's say, uh, this, is, this is Sea of Galilee, right? Bethsaida is like right over here. He takes them to this northwestern part of the Sea of Galilee, Bethsaida. It's the hometown of Peter and Simon uh, and Andrew and Philip. Okay, Peter, Simon, and then Andrew, Philip. They're, they're probably on the outskirts of town. And notice, look at verse 10, they withdrew, implying that they're going there to rest. They're making their way to Bethsaida, and they get out of town a little bit, and they're withdrawing from everybody, trying to get away from people. But, verse 11, the crowds learned this. The crowds learned this. They followed him, Jesus, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Crowd caught where Jesus is going, and of course, Jesus had compassion. Actually, Matthew tells us that Jesus had compassion. He's just tired. Disciples are tired. You know, if you've been involved in ministry at any degree, there's times when you're like, okay, ring, 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 ring. <laughs> All right. And that's kind of what happens here. They go to withdraw. The crowd finds them. Jesus has compassion on them. Look what Jesus does, by the way, at the end of verse 11, does the same thing he told the disciples to do. Declares to them the kingdom of God and heals them. 
ministers to them despite being tired. And then he does one of the most amazing things in verses 12 through 17. You have the famous story of the feeding of 5,000, which is inaccurate. It was probably about 10,000, as I'll explain. This is a miracle in verses 12 through 17 that all the Gospels have, one of the few miracles that you have in all the Gospels. And they all highlight different things to, to make a point. Probably the most extensive version of this is John chapter 6. And you can read that on your own sometime and see all that's developed from this amazing miracle in verses 12 through 17. Luke, quite frankly, doesn't even comment on it. He just narrates it straightforward. Right to the point. Doesn't tell us much about it. And so look at it, verse 12 through 13. Here you have this big crowd, verse 12. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go in the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions. For we're here in a desolate desolate place. All day Jesus has been ministering. All day Jesus has been healing. All day Jesus has been proclaiming. And the disciples, you know, Look at their sundial and they're thinking, man, it's getting late. Jesus, we can't feed these people. What are we going to do? So they come and they bring this to Jesus in verse number 12. They're outside of Bethsaida. It's time to go back into the town. It's time to find lodging. Darkness has come. It's time to eat. Disciples are probably tired as well. And so Jesus responds in verse 13, but he said to them, you give them something to eat. Now what's interesting Remember, Jesus has commissioned them, right? Already in chapter 6, he started to get them to do stuff, and here he does it again. All right, you get them something to eat. I mean, I mean, we throw the disciples under the bus for their lack of faith, but you would do the same thing. Look at verse number 13. We have no other than five loaves and two fish. And if you, if you read John 6, you realize they look around, they scrounge up five barley loaves and two fish. And they're like, what is that, verse 13, to, to feed this 5,000? Unless we're going to go and buy food for all these people, how are we going to feed them? There's no way that we could do this. You look at the beginning of verse 14, for there were 5,000 men. Matthew tells us that there were also women and children, which means at a minimum, there's probably about 10,000 people. Have you ever been in a crowd of 10,000 people? Okay, Just think about a crowd of 10,000 people, right? Sometimes we get perplexed as staff trying to feed you for like a staff meet, you know, for like a church meeting or something. It's mostly Abigail. But 10,000 people, five loaves, two fishes. That's all they got. And then you have in verses 14 through 16 an amazing miracle that doesn't even really read like a miracle. So verse 14 said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of 50 each. Again, groups of 50 each. Imagine trying to organize 10,000 people in groups of 50. And that would take a long time. There'd be a lot of confusion. They all, one, two, did I count him twice? Right? I mean, these are normal people working through this, trying to put this all together. You can imagine the mayhem, and he says, okay, just get them in groups of 50. In verse 15, and so they did that, had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. We're going to see him do that again at the end of the book over another meal. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. Most likely the fish, there's a bit of debate. It could have been like jellied fish, which must have been something they ate. I don't, doesn't sound good to me, but, you know, and, and, and then look, he just breaks it and gives it, sets it before the crowd And just like that, verse 17, I don't know what it looked like. I don't, you know, in my mind, did they rip it off and then hand it over and then it came back? I don't think so. They probably just kept ripping, but it kept not disappearing. And if it was jellied fish, they probably smeared it on and smeared it on and kept smearing it on. They they had something like that in St. Vincent's. Asked my wife about it. She loved it. It It's gross. Maybe eyes were looking at you. Anyways. But they just, it's just so unassuming of a miracle. And then before you know it, in verse 17, what was left over was picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces. These baskets are pretty large. They could hold about 20 stones, the word that's used for basket there. 12, probably because you had 12 disciples each grabbing a basket. 
And that's it. And Luke, there's nothing else about it. John, you look at it, they go nuts. They want to make Jesus king. But Luke doesn't bother with that. Why? Because Luke is subtly hinting at the answer to Herod's question in verse 9. John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? What is Luke trying to show us? It's answering that question. Jesus miraculously, miraculously feeds a large group of people in a desolate place in a manner that seems impossible. Has anyone else ever done that in history? Yeah. God. In Exodus 16. Somebody else who complained to Jesus, we don't have enough food. Or excuse me, the Lord, to Moses. The Lord has not given us enough food. And in Exodus chapter 16 is the famous manna that comes down from heaven and feeds the people of Israel in a place, again, in an unassuming way where they wake up one morning and there's manna before them. And a miracle takes place. And why does Luke mention this? Why does Matthew mention this? And John and Mark, all of them mention it for a bunch of reasons, but one main reason is so important, that the God of Scriptures is now here in flesh form as Jesus Christ. Who then is this man? None other than God himself, who performed a miracle like that in Exodus chapter 16, who performed a miracle like that, and you look at the end of 1 Kings 20, uh, I think it's 24 or 2 Kings 4, other passages where there's miraculous feeding of bread, all attributed to the great work of God. Christ is none other than God. Who is this? He asks in verse number 9, about whom I hear such things, none other than God himself in the flesh, Jesus Christ. That's who. There's other lessons that can be learned from this passage. But the big picture that he's trying to teach us is simple and straightforward. To be a disciple is to be one who's like Jesus, which means you're going to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. And this Christ, of course, is no one else than God himself. So, I ask us as a church, are we doing this? Are we doing this? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the lessons, the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ here. May we learn from him what it means to be a disciple so that we may live according to the way you've called us to live. May we be a people who proclaim the goodness of the kingdom of the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is very God himself, who took on flesh. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. May we honor and glorify you in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand.